On behalf of the President and Vice President, welcome to the White House Complex. My name is Doug Holscher, and I'm the Director of the White House Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Every day, the Intergovernmental Affairs team nurtures the partnership between federal, state, local, and tribal leaders. We aim to advance shared priorities and tackle mutual challenges like combating the opioid epidemic and reducing drug demand. President Trump is committed to fighting this epidemic of opioid abuse and addiction. And he knows that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to this problem. We need all stakeholders, federal, state, local, tribal, private sector leaders, the faith-based community, family members, healthcare professionals, friends and neighbors to tackle this challenge holistically. There are representatives from over 40 states and territories in this room today, and several tribal representatives as well, from various geographies, backgrounds, and political affiliations. Whether you are a health professional, workforce, human services, law enforcement official, you serve on the front lines of fighting this terrible epidemic. Each of you brings a unique perspective to this conference. And we want to hear from you. And that's why we built in several breakout sessions at the end of today's program. I especially want to thank the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials for partnering together to put on this important conference. Today, you'll hear from several federal leaders about what the Trump administration is doing to combat the opioid crisis in partnership with each of you. It is an honor to introduce the next speaker who is senior counselor to the president and a passionate champion for combating the opioid epidemic in partnership with state, local, and tribal leaders. Please help me in welcoming Kellyanne Conway. Thank you so much, Doug, for that lovely introduction, but really for your leadership here at the White House. As you know, President Trump has focused a great deal of attention and awareness on what we consider a legacy issue here, combating the opioid crisis and the drug demand drug supply epidemic that is roiling all of our communities. And even though the President and his whole of government approach across his entire administration is focusing on this issue, I want to say from the beginning that we are here to support your efforts, but not to subvert your efforts or to transplant our own judgment for yours. We think the people closest to the people in need know best how to administer to those needs. And what works in West Virginia is not going to work in Rhode Island. What is important to do in Washington State is different than Washington, D.C. And we acknowledge that, we appreciate that, and we are here to help accommodate that. You just saw two of the four ads that have been running for several months now. Uh, at last count, about two and a half weeks ago, 58% of youth in the target market between 18 and 24 years old had acknowledged in the research that they had been exposed to those ads. The president asked me recently, he said, I don't see these ads anywhere. I said, well, respectfully, neither you nor I are in the target market group. Uh, 18 to 24 year olds with a halo audience of 15 to 30 year olds. There's been a great deal of digital penetration from the ads. But also, we were able to do a deal with NBC Universal and all of its affiliates, uh, the Golf Channel, some of the specialized media, print media. And we teamed up with two very unlikely partners on this particular ad campaign effort. One is called the Truth Initiative, which has done a great deal of work over time in um, educating youth about smoking. But the other is the Ad Council. And the Ad Council, of course, is 75 years old, Smokey the Bear, Friends Don't Let Friends Drive Drunk, A Mind is a Terrible Thing to Waste. Uh, their board voted unanimously last year to team up with the White House, with the Executive Office of the President. They were going to do it anyway, but they see that the combined platform is that much more robust and far-reaching. What strikes me about those ads are, I would say, three big things. One is how quickly somebody can become addicted. From this Friday to next Friday, somebody that you know, let alone love, could become addicted to opioids. Number two, the extreme lengths to which our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our loved ones will go to feed that addiction. 
and third, I mean, if you took a fraction of the time that they're that they're taking to 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 do all these machinations just to get more drugs, if they took a fraction of that time to reach out to somebody in their circle of life, imagine the different result. But number three, not only are these ads raw, but they're real. These are all these are four true stories. So we didn't have to focus group our way into some fantastical script and go and find actors who fit the part. These are real accounts. Amy in the car got prescription opioids when she was 15 years old and got and had a soccer injury in high school. By the age of 18, she did what you saw there. Took off the seatbelt, drove 40 miles an hour on purpose into a concrete wall and got her wish. She got more opioids because she got more broken bones. I'm happy to report though that Amy is a mother of two and in recovery in Columbus, Ohio. Not everybody is so lucky. You've heard the harrowing statistics, 72,000 deaths, but I want to break that down for you a little bit. Among, uh, within the 72,000 deaths last year, thir nearly 30,000 were caused by fentanyl-related overdoses. And ladies and gentlemen, in your communities, in your states, if people don't know what fentanyl is, then we're all falling down on the job. I basically blame, shame, and name the media daily into not covering fentanyl. I think it should be like a daily segment on fentanyl and naloxone. If fentanyl was responsible for killing 30,000 Americans last year, it's basically a plane falling from the sky every single day. And if a plane fell from the sky, God forbid, every single day in this country, it is all, well, it's all most of us would be talking about. I'm sure we'd still have room for Russia and other sort of nonsense. But we'd be talking about the plane falling from the sky every single day. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about the fact that we're losing Americans every single day to drug overdoses, driven in large part because of the opioid use, but also because of the fentanyl. Synthetic opioid produced mostly, if not exclusively, in the labs in China, coming through our mails, our southern border, our ports of entry, sitting in sanctuary cities, and a tiny little grain, the Chief of Staff, General Kelly, who ran South Command, just this morning was talking about an article he read where they had a penny, and the fentanyl enough to kill you doesn't even cover the words, and it's true. And so we need people to know what fentanyl is. It is 100 times the potency of heroin, 50 times the potency, 50 times the potency of heroin, 100 times the potency of morphine. And it's being laced into marijuana, into heroin, into meth, into cocaine. Not everybody ingests it accidentally either. People are looking for a bigger high now. If you read the, if you read the stories every day that we rip from the headlines, people injuring their pets to go and get fentanyl and car fentanyl from the vet for their own use, the water being tested at Puget Sound and the muscles in the water being testing positive for opioids. It just goes on and on and on every single day we see it. And so rather than just get depressed and upset about the problem, let's talk about the solution. Our Surgeon General, Dr. Jerome Adams, put out the first Surgeon General's advisory in 13 years on any topic, and he committed it to naloxone. He wants to make sure that we get naloxone mainstreamed in America. And we have a, an increase in 264% of prescriptions dispensed of naloxone in pre, just during President Trump's tenure. The Surgeon General, the reason I'm not stepping on his lead, but the reason I want to mention it to you is because this whole of government approach allows America's doctor to feel comfortable to say, here's a new priority for us. Make sure that all of us are carrying it around and know how to use it. And uh, just this week, our wonderful Veterans Administration Secretary Wilkie, who, who you will hear about short, hear from shortly, announced that they would like naloxone to be in the defibril defibrillator. Can't talk today. Defibrillator um, cabinets. So trying to get that in the hands of the first responders, the school nurses, the health professionals, but expanding that into our own circle of lives is incredibly important. We already see positive trends coming from last October's declaration of the national public health emergency. This past March, the president called for a 30% reduction over the next three years in first-time opioid prescriptions, and we're already down 16%. For the first time in 25 years, there's been a decrease in the number of opioid prescriptions. You see, in a bipartisan fashion, governors and state legislatures working together to reduce that first prescription from 30 days to five or seven. And that is literally saving lives because it's days 8 through 30 where a lot of the trouble begins. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm 51 years old. So when I was a kid, a drug addict was a very conspicuous individual. 
they're snorting their cocaine off the mirror. You see them in the movies or in the back alleys with a needle in their veins. That sometimes is where opioid addiction ends, but it is not where it begins. It begins in your bathroom, in your medicine cabinet, in your handbag, in your trash can, being flushed down the toilet, just out and about next to the Tylenol and the cough syrup. And most opioid overdoses occur at home, the vast majority occur at someone's home. So we are part of the prevention and education literally right within our wingspan. Opioids are tricky. That tiny little bottle has a label that bears the name of the family doctor and the local pharmacy. It was legally prescribed to help someone. But not you if you're misusing it. And frankly, not you if your pain is already gone. So I'm happy to report because we are a month away now from the next National Take Back Day. Everybody here, I would urge you to get to triple, quadruple your efforts on Take Back Day. So last October, the president tweeted about it, the first lady was involved, the president gave a policy speech, gave a, um, his, his weekly address was about National Take Back Day. Google got involved, developing maps, um, national say everybody got involved in National Take Back Day. And we had a record collection of 906,000 pounds of unused pills. Now, had you told me 906,000 pills, I'd be wildly impressed, and I have pretty thick shock, shock absorbers. But 906,000 pounds of these tiny pills is mind-boggling about the supply that we're dealing with to begin with. 5% of the world's population in the US, we consume the vast majority of hydrocodone, um, certainly opioids. And so I said, well, that was amazing. Thankfully, we'll never break that record broke it the very next April. Six months later, the next National Take Back Day, 943,000 pounds. So a combination from October to April, 1.85 million pounds of unused, unneeded expired pills being brought forth. So we have another one coming up in four short weeks. You have a huge role to play in your communities just to make, people, make sure people know where to bring them. And no questions asked. Some people really worry about the liability. No questions asked. But we're also cracking down on prescribers, on doctor shopping. These prescription drug monitoring programs are effective, but I gotta tell you that the community pharmacists and the chain drug, tour, chain drug stores have also been terrific. They have come forward and said, we are cracking down on physicians who seem to have never met a patient to whom they have not prescribed um, significant copious amounts of opioids. We call this the crisis next door internally, and we have on the whitehouse.gov website, crisisnextdoor.gov, where if you click onto there, you will see people sharing their story, including the Surgeon General, including the President of the United States who shared his story first about his brother Fred succumbing to alcoholism at the age of 42. And we invite Americans and folks in your communities to share their own stories. No makeup, no fancy lighting, just their phones or a computer, raw, real, authentic, whether they are in treatment or recovery, they've lost a loved one, they're in law enforcement, they're a health professional, they're you, and how different the system is now. We've got, we have a tremendous effort from our First Lady on the Be Best initiative and her commitment in raising awareness and funding and treatment, access to treatment and full recovery for the NAS babies, the neonatal abstinence syndrome. 150 newborns come into this country every day now, struggling to take their first breaths. And it's everywhere. It's rural, it's urban, it's suburban. We call it the crisis next door because it busts through every geographic and demographic, and certainly political boundary. It does not discriminate. It's no longer somebody else's kid, somebody else's coworker, somebody else's community. It's everywhere, so the solution should include everyone. And the first lady raising awareness about the fact that one in 100 babies are now born chemically dependent, if not addicted, and we want to keep the mother and the newborn together. Yes, she is already racked with guilt and shame. It's better for her and it's better for the newborn to keep them together. And the First Lady, to her enormous credit, is raising awareness about this issue and making a signature policy prescription um, of, her, of her legacy, her portfolio here. Just last week, the administration announced another more than $1 billion in block grants to state and local entities, that's for you, so that you can fuel your community-driven response to this crisis. And we're not directing the way you use that. You are. That follows closely on the $6 billion 
of unprecedented funding that the President's leadership was able to secure through Congress. Unfortunately, that was on a strict party line vote because it was through the omnibus last fall, but, but it, or early this year, last fall, but six billion. At the high watermark, President Obama had about a half a billion in comparable funding, and we thought if we can get that doubled or tripled, that would be amazing, 12 times that. Because the members see how their communities are affected, they are responding in kind with the resources to what they see and hear and feel and witness on the ground. So I am very happy in what is intuitively a very divided city, if not divided nation, CEG yesterday. I'm very happy to tell you that on June 14th, the House passed the Senate, op excuse me, ha passed the House Bill 396 to 14, the largest one, one time package of legislation in our nation's history on any one drug crisis. It passed 396 to 14. One Democrat and 13 Republicans only voted against it. It went to the Senate. The Senate passed their version 99 to 1. Nothing passes 99 to 1. But that did. And that's because people are able to lay down their arms and pick up the cause and work together. So I encourage all of you to do the same. I'm sure you are. But talk about a nonpartisan issue starving for bipartisan solutions. And we're, at, we're starting to get it. I think the opioid legislation in this town shows what is possible when people come together and respond to a true, a true crisis. <clears throat> in addition, we are working with cabinet departments and agencies that you may not expect. So obviously, HHS and all the sub-cabinets, I, I see Ellie McCann-Katz, doctor in the back there, who is just a national leader and advocate on mental health. On, on drug addiction, on treatment and recovery. And thank you so much for your continued public service, Dr. Katz. Uh, obviously, the Surgeon General, NIH, FDA, CDC, all the subcabinets at HHS. And, and you'd be surprised to know we're working with DOJ and law enforcement interdiction. The seizures of fentanyl are way up. The seizures of these drugs are way up at the southern border. A, a, one, state, one state police officer in Maryland within the last six to eight weeks, one, stopped the tractor trailer, had enough fentanyl in it to wipe out everybody in this whole area. Uh, so these interdictions are, incre are increasing. They're actually going much better locally and, and, and statewide and federally. So you're not surprised you're working with DOJ. You're not surprised you're working with DHS at the border. You're not surprised that we're working with the VA because the VA is doing amazing work that pain management need not always mean pain, pain medication. In our rush to give our veterans everything they need to respect them, we're handing them two bottles of pills over the last however many years and decades. And that's one of the worst things we can do for non-combat related injuries, for a root canal, for a surgery, for an injury. And so we're work, they're working on alternative therapies and doing a fantastic job. But you may be surprised that we're working with Ann Hazlitt and the USDA. What they've done in rural America on opioids is simply remarkable. The Secretary Purdue and Ann, and I don't know if Betty Ann is here, and others, what they've done in short order in this administration is remarkable. Going, going to the people with the messages, with the resources. And that's the USDA. We're also working with the Department of Labor and with HUD. Why? Because we know a whole of government approach must treat the whole person or it's not going to work. If you are lucky enough to go through a drug court program or lucky enough to go into treatment and you come out on the other side successfully, and God bless you because it's, the statistics are still very harrowing, you go back and the only thing familiar to it are the drugs. What did we do for that person? There's no housing opportunity. There's no skills education. There's no workforce development and training. We want those people to avail themselves of one of the 6.7 million available jobs. So the Department of Labor, just a few weeks or months ago, recently awarded $22 million in displaced worker grants with an eye toward the opioid crisis to rejoin the workforce. Last week, I traveled with the Surgeon General and Secretary of Labor, Alex Acosta, and our second lady, Mrs. Karen Pence, to Richmond, Indiana, to witness firsthand a first-of-its-kind program in this country at Belden, B-E-L-D-E-N, Industries. Manufacturing plant, they make big wire fiber optic cables that outfit football stadiums and um, help some of these major TV stations. They have a Pathways to Employment program. If you fail a drug test while on the job, if you fail a drug test while you're applying for the job, they don't kick you out, but you have to enter a treatment program. And just in less than a year in operation, they're up to 23 
And we met personally. We sat across the table. We hugged and talked to two of the employees who had been affected, who failed that drug test. One guy had worked there for 23 years. He watched his own daughter be ravaged by heroin addiction. And he failed the drug test. And instead of losing his job, which also means losing his, his sole source of support, his dignity, and his hope, he kept the job, but he had to go into treatment. That is a model for the whole country. Not everybody's going to want to invest in their workforce and their workplace that way. But it is a model that can be replicated. We're now screening every federal inmate for drug addiction. We've increased the number of drug, support, drug courts we support by 60%. You're going to hear from the deputy director of ONDCP, my friend and esteemed colleague, Jim Carroll, soon. And he will talk about the grants and drug-free communities in the drug court. So I'll let him do that. But the access to medication-assisted treatment, the waivers that are being granted by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, we want your state to apply for its waiver. The president has asked for a year for Congress to consider a federal waiver, a blanket waiver, so that every state can bust through this 40-year ban on, on uh, this IMD 1115 exclusion of getting Medicaid reimbursement after you fill that 16th bed. It was meant to protect people from being a permanently or mostly institutionalized in mental health facilities, but it's having this very cruel, ironic effect on the ability to treat people in the drug crisis space. We're also uh, coordinating with other countries through law enforcement interdiction, transnational investigations, interdictions, and the president brought attention to that just this week up at UNGA. He basically is gently challenging other countries to join with him and join with our country in having not just a whole of government but a whole of governments pl plural approach uh, to help replicate our efforts against drug trafficking organizations. I mentioned earlier that we have over a billion dollars in grants but these are also these are to bolster prevention and treatment efforts and really just go across the, the gamut. Um, recently, the 50th Haida was opened. Jim Carroll was there in Alaska, the first Haida to be opened since 2001. It's pretty remarkable. And the 50th state to have one. And I hear from, I hear from those folks routinely. They are so happy um, to feel empowered. They feel respected, but they also feel resourced to be able to do their job. I, so I came here um, to give you a little bit of an update, but also to thank you. Thank each and every one of you for your service to your communities, to your states, to the citizens of, of your communities. Because without your commitment to public service, none of this would be possible. And I want to end where I began, which is telling you that we are here to support, but not to subvert, or to supplant our judgment for your own. You know best how to administer to the needs of your communities. And I have heard stories and needs and the allocation and distribution and use of resources as different and as many multitudinous as the people in this room. I'll pause for a moment and shift over to introducing the next speaker. He has uh, certainly committed himself to a career, a lifetime of public service, including helping our veterans and our military, many different, many, many different. Oh, Dr. Jawar, I hadn't seen you either. The fabulous Ash assistant. Secretary for Health at HHS, thank you so much, and God bless you. Doing a great job. But our next speaker recently took to an entirely new level his commitment to our nation's veteran by being confirmed in a bipartisan fashion to be the next secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs. His team has made amazing strides in combating the opioid crisis next door among our veterans' population. The Department of Veterans Affairs Opioid Safety Initiative itself has reduced use by over 45% over the last several years. The Overdose Education and Loxone Distribution Program that I just mentioned, including putting it in the defibrillator cabinets, has issued over 174,000 naloxone prescriptions with a success rate of over 345 overdose reversing efforts. The VA is training prescribers to use these pain management alternatives that I talked about, educating veterans about the dangers of opioid misuse and addiction, and offering evidence-based medication-assisted treatment to those in, needs, those in need. It also provides, to my earlier point, and please convey this in your communities, free 
free of charge take back mechanisms for our veterans. Our goal, and I know Secretary Wilkie shares this, our overarching goal is to have every day be take back day for everyone, and we are working on that. So without further ado, I present to you Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Dr. Ro Mr. Robert Wilkie. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, you know, Churchill said you never tell an audience that you're, you're glad to be there because no one will believe you. But Wednesday, um, I experienced my first um, appearance in front of one of the Senate committees, which is like a 1950s film noir movie. Only thing missing is the light bulb over your head. So I'm really glad to be here. And I, and I want to thank you for your service to our country. Um, I'm going to take us at the beginning in a little different direction and talk to you about veterans first emotionally and then, then practically. Uh, when I was sworn in uh, in the Oval Office a few weeks ago, I took my oath on a Bible that was carried into battle in 1918 by my wife's grandfather. He was a teenager. In his short life, he had never ventured beyond two or three counties in North and South Carolina, but by the time he was 18, he was marching up the Champs-Élysées into the bloody cauldron of the Meuse-Argonne battle. And another part of that battlefield was my great-grandfather, who'd left a young bud budding law practice in Cleveland, Mississippi, and he joined up with the 82nd Infantry Division in an artillery unit that actually my father ended up commanding 60 years later as part of the 82nd Airborne Division. And in another part of that unit, was, uh, that division was a reluctant soldier, a scratch farmer from Pall Mall, Tennessee, by way of Buncombe County, North Carolina, who would go on not only to earn the Medal of Honor, but to become the most famous and celebrated American of that war. Private Onslow Bullard, Captain A.D. Somerville, and Sergeant Alvin York. Three of two million Americans called upon to venture across the ocean and do extraordinary things and things that awed the world. They were the ones who allowed the United States to erupt on the world stage. And it is their descendants that we are honored to serve the Department of Veterans Affairs about 10 million of them, 10 million across the country. And the second part of my emotional plea to you is a story that you are all familiar with. I will not use the name, but I want to talk about another teenager, just like my wife's grandfather, 18 years old, small state, decided he would dedicate his life to the, the military of our country. He joined. He went to Iraq and Afghanistan. He came back, had a family, stayed in the reserves and guard, then had a, a nice job in the private sector. But he took a tumble. And it was the beginning of a dark journey when he started getting bottles and bottles of pills. He first lost his job, then he lost his family and he became close to death. Now the Department of Veterans Affairs, with the help of a Veterans Treatment Court, grabbed him by the neck and with a lot of innovative treatments, brought him back to our world. Without mentioning his name, last year he was voted as one of the top five nurses in his state, and his life is back on track. So now to the factual. Our VA has 143 hospitals across the country and 1,400 clinics. And in those clinics, as Kellyanne described, we are venturing on new paths to treat this national epidemic. As the veterans community, we are not immune from the things you see in health and law enforcement and state and local government. But we do have some good news. As Kellyanne said, veterans with opioid prescriptions down 45 percent. 
Long-term opioid therapy is now down 51 percent, and veterans on high-dose opioid therapy is down 66 percent. So, so how did how did we do it? How did an industrial age institution like the Department of Veterans Affairs that has and is we're losing practices that have been in place since General Omar Bradley took control of VA back in 1945, how did we adjust? Well, we brought in the community. We brought in pharmacists and prescribers. We instituted an, a system-wide oversight of opioids. We instituted patient risk assessments, and our education and outreach program was fully funded. We trained close to 500 clinicians in best practices and pain management through national and regional conferences. And importantly, we began to provide holistic, non-traditional care for those with opioid addictions. So let me tell you a little bit about what VA has to do that the private sector doesn't have to do. And I'll use my father as an example. 30-year soldier, senior commander in the 82nd Airborne Division, for his day, a big man. 6'2", 240. At the end of his career, after 30 years of jumping out of airplanes, after multiple tours in Vietnam, some of which ended prematurely because of severe combat wounds, he left active service needing two new knees, two new hips, had a bad back, and still had fragments in his body from Vietnam. Now, why do I use that? Because unlike the private sector, the Department of Veterans Affairs does not turn anyone away. Our unique population often comes to us after a lifetime of physical sacrifice that gives to them for the rest of their post-service life the potential for years and years of pain. But we don't turn anyone away but it makes our job in taking these veterans and getting them whole much more difficult. So we had to do something different. If you would have told my father 30 years ago that in order to combat the pain that he had accumulated from all those years of services, that he would be engaged in yoga and Tai Chi <coughs> the 45 would have been out of the holster and pointed in my direction. But that's what we're doing. We have brought in chiropractors. We've brought in nutritionists. We have brought in rehabilitation experts from our professional sports leagues and let them loose. We've gone to the best clinicians in America and said, can a combination of aspirin or Advil or aspirin and Tylenol substitute for Tylenol-3 and Vicodin. It has. So we are on the cutting edge, and it is one of the great unreported stories about what VA is doing, not just for our veterans, but for America as a whole, and I was very proud to focus on that part of our service when I appeared uh, before the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee on Wednesday. So as you probably guessed, I'm a recovering politician, recovering lawyer, so I'm not a clinician. I don't know a lot about your business. I know a lot about soldiers. So I will say that no matter how much we achieve at VA, we will never be able to complete the circle without help from organizations and individuals like you. I will give you an example. Opioid abuse is part of a terrible spectrum. It's probably the, the foundational part of a spectrum that sadly often leads to suicide or premature death. We experience, according to the latest numbers, about 20 veteran suicides a day across America. Now, they are primarily from my father's generation in Vietnam. But of those 20 veterans, 14 are outside of our VA system. We are feverishly working with state, 
local and community leaders to find these veterans and get them into our system. The same applies to our response to America's opioid crisis. We cannot, we cannot reach all of America's warriors unless we have your cooperation. And I am happy to say that the Department of Veterans Affairs is engaged in a massive, massive outreach program to all of our states and territories. I also want to want to say something about um, one of the changes that has occurred in the attention that we have paid to our veterans. Um, I am one of those people who experienced the full force of the Jesuit fathers growing up. And um, we were often told about a Jesuitical limbo. Now for someone in the executive branch, Jesuitical limbo is what you are when you are the acting secretary. I was the acting secretary for eight years. That means you, you have a title, but you're not really. Um, um, but I was amazed, and I, I think I would embarrass him for saying this, I was amazed at the amount of time the President of the United States spent with me during that time when I was in limbo. In those eight weeks, I think I counted eight or nine hours that I was involved in a direct conversation with the President, talking about veterans, but talking about the two issues that afflict us on a daily basis that we have yet to get our arms completely around. One was homelessness and one was opioids. So I will say, and I, do, I say it with all humility, that the President of the United States is providing leadership for our veterans community the likes of which I have not seen in my professional and military career, and I thank him very much, very much for that. So Kellyanne talked about things like National Drug Take Back Day. Um, we in this administration have unleashed a $930 million uh, state opioid uh, response grant. Um, our CMS system is approving uh, state waivers for substance abuse disorder treatment by expanding access to resources. And again, for our VA, we are engaging all of you and the national medical community to make sure that those numbers that I reported at the beginning continue to go down. I will leave it at that. We uh, want to be partners with you. We are ready to do it. We think we have found a new way, a new way ahead that the entire nation can use. And I will close with a story that I'm very fond of telling because it says everything you want to know about what VA does and what our veterans mean. Um, I am a great admirer of General Eisenhower. Uh, having grown up around the Army, um, I came up in a period where I actually knew officers who served under him. And uh, I am honored to hold his picture in the office of the Secretary. Uh, in 1952, when General Eisenhower was running for president, he made a very specific promise. He said, I will go to Korea. And when he got to Korea, he actually went in Christmas of 1952, a, few, a month before he was inaugurated. He told the soldiers, I will bring you home. And a few months after his inauguration, uh, he had been briefed that he had inherited the presidential yacht Williamsburg. Now for Eisenhower, a man of the American heartland, the thought of having a presidential yacht in a democracy in a time of war was anathema to his consciousness. So he ordered it scrapped. But there was one authority that Eisenhower could not counterman, and that was Mamie. And she said, no, keep it. But when you take it out, take it out with soldiers on it. And so months after his inauguration, he took it out for its, its first run during his administration. And on board were 40 Korean War soldiers, some horribly disfigured, others missing limbs. And you know what happened next. The Washington Kabuki dance kicked in. The president pulled up in his limousine and immediately the Secret Service deployed 
ran up the plank and began to separate the president from his troops. Now, as only a five-star general of the Army could do, General Eisenhower yelled, Halt, get behind me. I know these men. And he walked up the plank, and he asked those who could to stand at attention while he addressed them. And he said, my orders to you are that you never put away your uniform. You live every day to remind Americans that the cost of freedom is never free. And I believe he quoted George Orwell, whom he'd gotten to know when he was the Supreme Allied Commander in London. And he said, gentlemen, you exist every day to remind your fellow citizens why they sleep soundly at night. I cannot think of a better way to describe the mission of the Department of Veterans Affairs than to say we exist to remind Americans why they sleep soundly at night. If we don't get a handle on our opioid crisis and subsequently homeless and veteran suicide, we are doing a great disservice not only to the veterans who live with us now, but to those who preceded them because we want to ensure that every veteran we serve, every veteran you see in your community, never puts away his or her uniform and reminds Americans why we all sleep soundly at night. I can't thank you enough for what you were doing. You were on the cutting edge of getting, getting a final handle on this terrible crisis, and I thank you on behalf of our nation's veterans. I thank you on behalf of the Department of Veterans Affairs. So God bless everything you do, and thank you very much. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. I'm a big disappointment. My name is Katie Talento, and I'm replacing Andrew Bremberg here, who was supposed to be moderating this panel. He's head of domestic policy. I'm the special assistant to the president for Domestic Policy Council here that handles the opioid crisis. And it is my delight to be here to introduce the panel of luminaries that we have. I'm really excited that they all were able to make it and to give you um, a sense of of what we're up to on opioids, both at the state and the federal level. I know you've heard from some of our leading lights already. These are the folks that are really in the trenches and leading the teams, the legions of people actually that we have working on this issue throughout the administration. So I, I know that you've already heard today, I'm sure that this is a top priority for the president and his whole administration, and it is. We do expect the crisis to get worse before it gets better, as the President said on a number of occasions. Just this year, deaths are still going up, but we do have good news. Prescription rates are going down, and I think you're going to hear more of the good news um, from, from some of our panelists. So with that, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and get started and introduce these guys. Um, immediately right next to me is the Attorney General of Utah, Sean Reyes. Thanks for being here, leading great law enforcement efforts over in the state. And then we have Jim Carroll, our Deputy Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. And next to Jim, we have Ann Hazlett, who is the Assistant Secretary for Rural Development at the United States Department of Agriculture. Next to Ann, we have Admiral Brett Joie, who is the acting, no, he is the, in fact, Secretary, I always think of him as the ash, that's why that came out. 
he's the ASH, the Assistant Secretary of Health at the Department of Health and Human Services. He's in charge of basically coordinating the entire Public Health Service Act agencies. He runs the show over there, it's great. And next to the Admiral, we have John Martin, who is the Assistant Administrator over at DEA for diversion, which as we know in this crisis has been a huge problem, a huge fueler, um, catalyst of the problem and of the crisis, and I'm, I'm excited to hear from John today. So I just want to start off with a, a few questions I'm going to lob out to the group, and please feel free to answer one, two, or all, or all three of them to tell us um, a couple things. One, can you, and, and I'll just let you go in whichever order you like. If you don't volunteer, I'll call on you. So, uh, <laughs> so it's just like high school. Um, can you give me an example of an aha moment that you all have had in working on the opioid crisis when you realize something critical or something or someone um, that was important that came together that helped you overcome a key challenge in your role? That's question one, an aha moment, if you will. Question two, what's been the hardest gap to fill? We know, I mean, we have thrown everything we have at this and still there's so much to be done. There's so, we're just at the beginning. We're maybe are at the end of the beginning. Um, so what's been the hardest gap to fill? What do you perceive the, your personal biggest challenge in your area of, of responsibility going forward? What is the most hopeful sign Ending on a positive note, what are the most hopeful signs or signs that you've seen so far on the opioid response? Does anyone want to start? You, you know, I can, I can jump in. I was given explicit instructions that we were supposed to give a minute and a half to two minute intro before we answer any questions. I don't want to get kicked out of the White House because I just barely got in. And so I, I'm going to just lead off with a, some thoughts that way, and then happy to dive in to yep. answer any questions. First of all, thank you. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, and thank President Trump and our First Lady and his administration and all of these. I, I can't think of better public servants that I've worked with than the folks that I'm sitting here with, and it's amazing the impact that it's having at a local level, and I'm, that's, I think that's why I'm here, to be able to try to offer some perspectives from a, a local uh, level. I know Kellyanne talked about a number of statistics. I'm just going to share a few. I know I'm speaking or probably preaching to the choir with you all here who've been in this fight for a long time, but there are many who are listening to us right now, and I hope that this catches their attention. She talked about uh, 72,000 deaths alone last year, 66,000 in 2016 deaths from overdose. Uh, that is more, just to put it in context, than we've lost more Americans in the entire Vietnam conflict combined. If you look at the number of those deaths, the vast majority came from opioid-related overdoses. And opioids have leapfrogged opioid-related deaths, 16, 17, over gun deaths, over even deaths by breast cancer. And in no way am I trying to minimize all of those other threats and serious issues. But just to put in context, as Kellyanne did, the urgency of this epidemic that is ravaging so many of our local communities. I also think that there's a, a little bit of pressure on me as the voice for the state agencies and state representatives who are here. I'm proud to represent all of those voices. I was telling my team, I know they could have picked somebody better looking. I know they could have picked somebody more articulate but I don't think they could have picked somebody more fortunate to be able to have the partners that we have in my great state. And when the time comes, I'd love to be able to elucidate more and more about how we've layered local, county, city, tribal partnerships along with our state, and then look to our great partners at the federal level to help uh, inject sorely needed resources. Um, and, and again, the folks on this panel, you'll, which you'll hear from, they're superstars. And they're not only leading from D.C., they're leading by coming into our state. Several of them have been in my state, not flyovers. They've been in the trenches listening and then deploying assets. And I'm going to talk about that a, a little bit later on. So in, in conclusion, let me say this for opening remarks. This is not a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. So this is a humanitarian issue, it's something I've said for years. And it's starting to permeate, I think. It's nonpartisan. It's bipartisan. We have to figure out ways. Kellyanne said it uh, more eloquently than I. It is no respecter of persons. It does not discriminate. It's a killer of people of every single background. 
and because of that, we need everyone coming together. There's a lack of connectivity. Sometimes we're too siloed in all of what we're doing, and that's why these type of fora are so critical to bring us together. But there's also a lack of connectivity for those who are caught in the throes of the cycle of addiction, and they need to feel that there are people out there who care about them, and, who, and there, there need to be resources to back up that care. So all of those things combined, and finally, there needs to be a, uh, an elimination of shame and judgment. There needs to be the ability to talk honestly about this issue without the stigma that is for too long attached um, to addictions. And, and with that, I'll defer uh, to some more substantive remarks after my colleagues have been able to, um, to speak. But thank you to each of you and the agencies that you represent, to the secretaries and those others that you work with. Um, you have saved lives, not just in my state, but in every state in the nation. God bless you. Thank you, General Reyes. Um, I am Jim Carroll. Um, as Katie said, I am the Deputy Director of ONDCP, and I'm honored to be the President's nominee to be the Director. Um, I have had the opportunity um, to be in Salt Lake City, um, along with Ann, um, to um, be there. We have also been in so many of your communities. Um, I'm looking at the Surgeon General on the side. He and I were together in Philly on Saturday, Friday and Saturday of last week. Um, anyone from Philly? Um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Eagles fan? No. That's <laughs> <laughs> Hail to the Redskins. Fan. Right. Awesome. Um, everyone's here a Redskins fan. Um, we are out in the community because that's the best way to learn, um, to hear what's happening in the, um, unfortunately, in the country. This is a local issue, and that's why it's important for us to be in communities, whether it's to go to Salt Lake City, um, to go to Loudoun County um, in Virginia, which is just a short drive away, um, 30 minutes probably. Sheriff Chapman. Okay, um, and so many different places. Um, and we've been all over the country, um, this panel, um, and so many members of the administration who are here working um, today and that I want you to meet. Because the reality is this is a local problem. If there was an emergency um, and your house is on fire, your neighbor needed help, they're not gonna call an 800 number to ONDCP or um, an 800 number to the Department of Ag. We try to work very hard, or to even HHS or DEA. If there's an emergency, you're gonna call 911. Um, Sheriff Chapman here in the front row is gonna come. Um, the men and women who serve him. The first responders are, who are in the room, I saw a couple of them in the back that we've worked with and partnered um, for um, the folks on ambulance cruises, medics coming out, fire departments coming out. And so at the end of the day, that's what we have to realize is this is the community that you're working in. And so we have to recognize that. That's why we are on the road to be with you to get that understanding. The President's initiative to combat opioid abuse um, has really three main components. You heard Kellyanne talk about it. But the first is prevention and making sure and getting the message out um, to individuals and to make sure um, that we tell them. And that's why these ads that you saw, they're a little bit raw, I'm not gonna kid you. Um, and obviously to some of you, they might be concerning. But um, these are real stories, and we want to make sure that people, and especially the young people, these kids, and whether they're 16 or 25, that's a lot younger than me, and so 20, if there are any 25-year-olds, um, how old are you? 20. And so you're an adult, um, and, but your dad sitting next to you, I think he would say that um, you're still a kid. I'll, please, <laughs> no disrespect. Um, and um, we have to get the message out of that um, because we're trying to protect our children. Um, and our family members. My family's not immune. Um, one of my family members started with an addiction uh, um, prescription last year um, and came to us and said, I'm addicted, I need help. And thankfully we were able to intervene, um, get them into um, emergency um, detox and treatment and they're now um, 14 months sober um, by the grace of God. Um, and um, our faith played a large part in that, um, helping us through as a family and helping our individual through. And again, that's a local issue, not a government, you know, DC only issue. And so getting the word out there. Um, the other part of this is providing treatment to those who need it. Um, we have to embrace those people um, and love them unconditionally. They have a disease and um, the, they might have made a wrong choice at the beginning, but it's not a moral failure on their part. Um, and we have to convince those people who believe otherwise that if faith is gonna play a part in what we do here, we have to recognize that. I am 
very proud to be very pro-life, as many people here are. And if I'm going to live my faith and be pro-life, that means I have to embrace those people that want to live and the people who need treatment. I have to help them live. And that's why I have to live my faith on that. The last part is just as important, um, and quite frankly, I know John's going to talk about that, um, is stopping the flow of drugs coming into the country. These are poisons that are coming in. People are profiting um, off people that have this addiction, and those people need to be hit relentlessly um, who are profiting off these poor people that have an addiction. And we're working hard um, with the DEA um, and the rest of the Department of Justice and so many other places, including Department of Defense. Um, but at the end of the day, it's also a local issue. 80% of everyone who wears a badge and um, carries a weapon is at the local and state level. And so we can work hard at the federal government. I was in Columbia three weeks ago um, with President Duque, the new president down there, in four weeks, five weeks. Um, I'll be in Mexico with AMLO, the new president down there, um, trying to interdict the flow of heroin coming in. Um, the DEA labs show that 93% of all the um, heroin that is tested in the U.S. comes from Mexico, so um, that's critical. So um, we are doing everything here at the White House we can to work with the rest of the partners um, that are in the room, and so it's great to be with you and look forward to talking with all of you. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Ann Hazlett, and I am at the Department of Agriculture. Um, at USDA, our core mission under the leadership of President Trump and our Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, is to be a partner in creating prosperity in rural America. And we are part of the President's team uh, in battling this issue because, as many of you know, if you come from rural places, this is deeply impacting the quality of life and the economic opportunity that we have in so many small towns across the country. And our role at the Department of Agriculture and as part of this administration is to be a partner um, to those of you who are on the front lines in these communities to help you build that effective response that you know will work for this crisis in, in your town. So to do that, we are focused really on three things. First, we're providing uh, resources uh, to build an infrastructure, if you will, for prevention, for, for treatment, and for recovery in rural America. We're facilitating partnerships and we're help, trying to help drive innovation uh, in rural areas. First, with respect to infrastructure, uh, we have programs with funding uh, for prevention, for treatment, and recovery. We also, however, have a number of programs and perhaps our greater role is to help address some of the deeper and more systemic issues that you often find in rural communities that have been impacted by this crisis. Things like lack of broadband infrastructure to get access to high-speed internet, uh, lack of business opportunity and jobs that people need uh, to live lives of prosperity. Uh, there's many more details about the programs that we have uh, on an opioids webpage uh, that we have on the USDA website. And beyond those programs that we have, we are really looking at how we can build better tools for rural leaders who are on the front lines of this issue. Things like a resource matrix, a community action guide for rural communities, a model practice library, and risk assessment tool. And with respect to partnerships, one of, the thing that's, one of the things that's been amazing to be part of in the, under the President's leadership is to see, see really an all-hands-on-deck approach to this. As Kellyanne noted, we've had an opportunity to work on a daily basis with so many of the agencies that you'll hear from today. And as we do that, I've uh, been thrilled to be part under Director Carroll's leadership of a, of a rural opioids. Uh, committee uh, within ONDCP that's looking at all of the resources that are, are here in the federal family to help rural communities address this issue. Also working very closely with HHS, Department of Justice, and another of agencies. Uh, with respect to stepping outside of the government, um, there's also a lot of opportunity for partnership development with rural stakeholders. Uh, we've been working hard to build new connections between some of the different groups that often become siloed, especially with the urgency of this issue. Um, groups like the National Association of Counties, the American Farm Bureau, which is a production agriculture organization that is not generally intersecting with sheriffs, counties, rural health association interests. And so we've been able to play really a facilitator role of bringing those groups together on a regular basis to be staying connected on what is taking place and where the gaps are. And lastly, with respect to 
innovation. Uh, we're really uh, focused on finding what th those model practices, things that are already working in a community. While no two small towns are the same, we certainly know many of the challenges are and some of the things that have worked in one place can work in another. In order to do that, we've held a number of rural roundtables around the country, taking what we've learned there and uh, not only using that information to uh, inform our own tools, but helping to share that with some of our rural stakeholder partners as they're building out a response as well. So I think like many of you in this room, uh, we believe that this battle will be won town by town, fa family by family, and I just want you to know that we are here as a partner to rural America uh, in that fight. Good morning. As Katie said, my name is Brett Giroir, and I'm the Assistant Secretary for Health, often referred to as the ASH. I'm also the senior advisor to the Secretary for Opioids Policy, and it's really an honor to be here. And the most important thing I would say is we didn't just get introduced. We worked together across in a whole government effort uh, led by Kellyanne and by the President. We meet weekly, often daily, to work together to bring all our departments together uh, in a singular effort to be synergistic against opioids. Um, Throughout HHS, we, we have massive activities across all our agencies, and my job is to make sure that they are coordinated and I could represent HHS to the other agencies within the government and to work with the states. Now, we don't talk about the 700 initiatives that we have or the 71 sub-strategies, but I would like to highlight the five pillars of our response that really guides us every single day. The most important, they're all very important. Number one is improve access to prevention, treatment, and recovery services. Opioid use disorder is a disease. Telling one to stop using opioids without the appropriate medication-assisted treatment, without the psychobehavioral support and the wraparound recovery services is like telling you, please stop breathing for the next 10 minutes. If you can do that, then we can ask someone with a disease to stop without the appropriate support. Uh, Assistant Secretary Eleanor McCann's cats in the back of the room has been a national leader and a pioneer in medication-assisted treatment, always talking about this, and she has transformed the way we can provide technical assistance and help to the states, particularly re involving her state opioid response grants, almost a billion dollars released two weeks ago, HRSA money and other $400 million getting right to the front line. We're also interested not only treating the disorder, but all the syndemic consequences, such as hepatitis C virus, which has gone up almost 300% in the United States due to IV drug use. We're concerned about resurgence of the HIV, and as Kellyanne said, I'm a pediatric critical care physician. I have taken care of babies with neonatal abstinence syndrome. We're very concerned about the short-term and long-term consequences. The second pillar is enhance the availability of overdose reversing medications, naloxone. Naloxone does not cure opioid use disorder, but it provides a second chance of life. Everybody needs that second chance and an on-ramp to move into recovery. My colleague, Surgeon General Jerome Adams, uh, has been a champion for naloxone. His advisory, as Kellyanne said, the first one in 13 years, had a marked improvement in uh, naloxone availability across the country. And as of yesterday, compared to January 2017, monthly prescriptions for naloxone are now up over 350%. Our third uh, pillar is advance the practice of pain management to decrease the inappropriate use of opioids. Clearly, we want to reduce the inappropriate prescribing of opioids. At the same time, we need to help those in pain. The latest data from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, again, a SAMHSA product, showed that the primary reason that people misuse opioids is because of pain. If we do not solve the pain crisis in the United States, we will never solve the opioid crisis in the United States. Number four, strengthen public health data reporting and collection. We work hand in hand with the states and localities every day, primarily through the CDC, to enhance our ability to detect what's killing our children what's causing the overdoses and to report that nationally but also locally so that we could respond in an appropriate way to save lives and provide on-ramps into therapy. And finally, the fifth point is to support cutting-edge research that improves our understanding of pain and addiction, leads to new treatments, and identifies effective public health interventions. This has primarily been owned by the NIH, but not solely. The NIH, FDA, SAMHSA, CDC, my office uh, of OASH, are all working together to improve the ability to treat people 
to have them uh, sustain in long-term recovery. And I would highlight just last week, there was a notice of funding opportunity from the NIH called the Healing Communities Initiative. This is co-led by the NIH and SAMHSA with Dr. Ellie McCann's Katz and Dr. Francis Collins. This will provide the opportunity for hundreds of millions of dollars to come into local communities hard hit to develop a comprehensive program across all of government, not just HHS, but labor, HUD, DOJ, USDA, working together with local authorities with the goal of reducing overdose mortality within those communities by 40% within three years. So again, this has been um, what I've trained for all my life and as and a physician, as a public health uh, professional. Um, it is the worst epidemic and public health challenge of our time, and I'm privileged to be here working on this team and happy to show a little bit later some of the positive signs we have if we have time for that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Admiral. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of Acting Administrator Utam Dillon uh, and the 9,000 men and women of the Drug Enforcement Administration, I want to say uh, I thank you for uh, allowing me to be here today. Um, I want to also thank our federal and state interagency partners here at the table um, who we work with every day, day in and day out, to combat this crisis. And I also want to give a special thanks to Kellyanne Conway and the White House staff for uh, putting on this um, important uh, discussion today. So as was stated earlier, my name is John Martin and I am the Assistant Administrator for Diversion Control at DEA, and in that role, uh, I oversee the manner in which DEA performs its regulatory function over its 1.78 million registrants nationwide. So those are everyone in the, in the uh, drug supply chain, importers, manufacturers, uh, distributors, doctors, pharmacists, hospital clinics, and researchers. So with the majority of new heroin initiates uh, or new heroin users stating that they started their cycle of addiction by misusing a prescription uh, pain reliever, we have to be laser focused um, and find new opportunities to leverage the program that I run to affect real and meaningful change. And since I have uh, the, the, the crowd here today and a lot of uh, um, public health officials, I wanna make sure I just talk a little bit today um, about just how law enforcement needs to coordinate with public health officials in rural communities and in all communities um, when we're about to take enforcement action, let's say on a, a pill mill that's operating on the outskirts of your town, just to make sure that we can try to eliminate unintended consequences and that um, we're not impacting patient care. So with that, um, I think we're ready to, to start the questions or the answers. Great, thanks. So just to reiterate the questions that I originally asked, hopeful signs, gaps, and maybe an aha moment, non-traditional allies. Thanks. Feel free. I'm happy to jump right back in, uh, in line. L let me try to address and frame maybe the aha moment for you, uh, Katie. Thank you. Since I came into office in 2013, this has been a top priority for uh, me and my office to deal with this epidemic. But if you look at the multifaceted issues, it is pretty daunting. There are so many layers. We liken it to the Gordian knot of mythology because it's so complex and interwoven and trying to get your arms around any one piece is challenging enough. Trying to do it comprehensively is hard. And I, and I up front want to throw out some shouts to some of my colleagues in a bipartisan way. And feel free if it's your state to raise your hand because I'd love to acknowledge and um, my colleagues, uh, General George Jepson from Connecticut, um, uh, General Carl Racine from right here in Washington, D.C. These are Democrat colleagues who have worked closely uh, with me on these issues. And I'm going to mention a couple of my other colleagues, uh, Brad Schimmel in Wisconsin, uh, Pam Bondi out in Florida, Alan Wilson. Fe I, no one's raising their hand. They so are, I guess all three. Are they? Okay. <laughs> all uh, how about uh, South Carolina? I uh, said Alan Wilson. Texas, uh, uh, Ken Paxton, General Carr in Georgia. There you go. There's some Georgias. Uh, Morrissey in West Virginia, how about, how about you West Virginians? I know it's a, it's a huge issue. Uh, General Hawley uh, out in Missouri, uh, Marshall in Alabama, Hunter in Oklahoma, these guys have been in the trenches. How about Mike DeWine also in Bill Schutte, uh, Ohio and Michigan, uh, great football rivals there. But when it comes to opioids, we get together and work together. And this bipartisan group has been an amazing group to work with, but all of us were struggling with the same thing. 
we represent all of our state agencies, we work in law enforcement, how do we actually get our arms around all of this? And we in Utah had a fantastic DEA district agent in charge, Nikki Holman, who I loved, she was amazing. We lost her and we thought, oh gosh, what are we gonna do now? Well, we felt like God answered a prayer and sent the energizer bunny of all DEA personnel into our uh, jurisdiction, a guy named Agent Brian Besser, who didn't wait for anyone to call him. He just showed up at my office his first or second day a few years ago, uh, now two and a half years, and said, we need to do something right now. Uh, he's been amazing at, at staying focused on his uh, primary mandate to interdict and, and drug crimes. We've got lawyers uh, embedded in his office to prosecute crimes, but he said DEA is about so much more now. And we've got incredible programs like DEA 360. And he started to weave himself into the fabric of our state in a way that I've never seen a federal agency do. And right now, if you go to Utah, they want to build a gold statue because Brian Besser, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter where you are, who you are, he and his team will be there. I joke that if Utah annexed the Klingon Empire somehow from Star Trek, Brian Besser would be happy to be the first one to go out there and do training and be there with his folks. And so this is not a commercial for him or the DEA, but it's just to underscore what can really happen when federal agencies buy into what locals are doing and vice versa, and they, we tap resources. So immediately what the aha moment was, he said, Sean, we've been too siloed for far too long. Everybody's running around with great energy, all noble intentions, but we're all running around doing different things. We need a task force that won't just talk about stuff and won't just study things. All those are important, critical. But we want to take all those great ideas that are germinating in all of these state agencies, and I'm going to mention a couple of them in a second. We're going to put them all together and we're going to get stuff done, immediately bust doors down. I need you, and we're going to call on some other partners. We started a state opioid task force, chaired by me and the AG's, state AG's office, Senator Mike Lee, district agent in charge Brian Besser from the DEA, and immediately recruited critical elements. Dr. Jennifer Plum, who not only runs Utah Naloxone, but is a critical voice in the recovery community for uh, physicians, for prescribers. Our Speaker of the House, Greg Hughes, who is helping us get legislation passed. And we cherry-picked a number of other critical leaders. And right away, we, we didn't upend anything else that all the other agencies and organizations were doing, but we tried to catalyze them, put them together and say, you know what, you've got great ideas, let us help you bust the door down and take care of them from a federal, state, local, county, tribal uh, uh, um, perspective. And, and I want to, because I think this, I have a hunch that this might be my last chance to, uh, to address some of these state, federal interactions because you, you're here actually to listen to our federal uh, agencies talk about all the wonderful programs that they have. But I suspect, too, that some of you out there have similar structures in your state. And I want to go over just quickly the partners that we have, because some of it might sound familiar to you in state government. Some of it might be a little um, different than how you're doing it. I'd love to learn from you later, and hopefully I can share something that might be of interest to you. So right away, we not only had the DEA come in, help us start this, we, we reached out uh, to the state legislature. Just last year in 18 alone, we passed 10 different opioid-related bills. Some give more teeth to prosecutors. Some help us gather better, more efficient data, which is critical. And it was a bipartisan effort, uh, again, from, from the beginning. Great support from the state legislature. So definitely recruit. If, and I'm, I know there's some leaders from the legislature here. We also thought, you know, you have to entertain to educate. And education is such a critical component. People don't understand the severity of the problem, they don't understand that there are resources and they lose hope. So we went out and grabbed people like Court McGee, a ultimate fight champion who is popular in Utah. We grabbed NFL players, NBA players, we got people uh, like Court Stanley Havili and said, you be our emissaries and our ambassadors, you can get into places and touch people and lift people that no one else can. Court, superstar now, he was dead from an uh, opioid related overdose for minutes on the street. Somehow God gave him a second chance to revive himself and he went on to fame and glory, but now gives back to the community. We went to the grassroots level, to people like Jenny McKenzie in our state who created a movie called Dying in Vain. This movie we've shown along with the DEA movie, Chasing the Dragon. We've shown it with other films like the Wahlberg Foundation's films that they have to help educate and it went to Sundance and immediately started to help us gain visibility. A, a, a gentleman named Dennis Shakini who lost his son Tennyson back home. Uh, an architect uh, of, of just the, the greatest uh, salt of the earth person to meet. He started to coordinate golf tournaments and other things around into the community to help us. 
as was mentioned by Kellyanne earlier, we recruited civic groups from Rotary and Kiwanis to Junior League to make sure that they were participating in this, interfaith groups. I've got an uh, evangelical task force, and the first call was Pastor Greg Johnson. Pastor, I need all of, your, all of your pastors, all your ministers in on this, and they immediately signed up, and with enthusiasm, encouragement. We'll, we'll kneel and pray together in the Capitol and then go out and, and, and hope that God will bless us in efforts to reach those who need it. But it's not just evangelicals. Catholic community, our Jewish community, Orthodox Jews, uh, more modern uh, rabbis, all of them coming together. The LDS Church, which is a little bit of a presence in Utah, all in, um, in any way that we've needed help. Getting them to work together has been the key, that connectivity that I talked about. And now, Utah Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. That's the SAMHSA funding that we've been getting. That's been our mother's milk throughout this time from Health and Human Services. Can't thank enough Doug Thomas, Brent Kelsey, back home for doing what they do. Utah Coalition for Opioid Overdose Protection. Our DE agent was chairing that uh, Besser until our Lieutenant Governor just took that over. And that's with our Department of Health, our awesome Dr. Miner there who works closely to gather data and to work. Th they were doing so many things before we created this task force, General but we're now Reyes, partners. I'm gonna ask you to okay, just I'm, I am, I'm, give I'm, everyone a chance to. I, I, I can't tell you, we've got the recovery community, Mary Jo McMillan, Children's Justice Centers, County City Tribal Partners, all working together, all united in this effort, but sharing information, not worrying about credit, trying to get data, and then reaching out now, and this is, again, my, my point, people like our Surgeon General who come out and deploy assets. Utah Farm Bureau lost its director, Randy Parker, because he joined USDA, and he has been a dynamo. And Ann Hazlett and Randy just announced three weeks ago that another $400,000 in grants are being deployed, one to a community that's the fifth highest mortality rate for overdoses in the United States and Carbon County in Utah. Others to the Four Corners region where we have tribal and county interests. It takes everyone. And if you haven't gotten at least my view that we couldn't do it without our federal partners and we've desperately needed this help for a long time, I hope that I'm communicating sufficiently my appreciation on behalf of the citizens of Utah. And as I talk to my other colleagues, every other state, for what this administration is doing. And I said it before, God bless you. I will say it again. God bless each and every one of you. You are in our prayers, and I hope that the nation joins us in prayers because it will take divine intervention to address and overcome this clear and present danger. Thank you. Thanks, General. I want to give um, Admiral Joie an opportunity because you looked like you were jumping out of your seat. You, wanted to, you had things to report. I want to hear some hopeful signs. Okay, uh, well, well, thank you, and um, we are in the midst of the worst public health crisis of our time. Far too many people are still dying or overdosing, but I, I want people to understand that although we face a Herculean task, it is not a futile one, and we are seeing positive signs of all of your efforts collectively. The aha moment is there's no silver bullet, but as somebody told me, there's a lot of silver buckshot. We have to bring all of those agencies together, uh, working together in order to help the problem. So some positive things. I think as Kellyanne said, but um, as of yesterday, again, the total morphine milligram equivalents dispensed monthly compared January 2017 to August down 20%. The number of unique individuals receiving buprenorphine treatment in that time up 21%. And the number of individuals receiving naltrexone up 47%. Uh, the number of naloxone prescriptions up 367 percent. These are all kinds of indicators that we've been working for. So are there results? As of the NISDA data that SAMHSA published two weeks ago, compared to 2015 to now 2017, there are 1.4 million people less who are misusing pain relievers. There are 300,000 people less with pain reliever use disorder. In 2017 compared to 2016, the number of people who used heroin for the first time dropped over 50%. That is a remarkable finding and one that I think we can all uh, take hope in. According to the CDC, the latest data we have from the Enhanced State Opioid Overdose Surveillance Database compared non-fatal overdoses 
the third quarter of 2017 to the fourth quarter of 2017, non-fatal overdoses decreased 13% during that time period, and the preliminary data look even better for 2018. And finally, although the mortality is horrific, uh, affecting over 2.5% of our overall mortality, up to 20% in the younger age groups, when you look at the mortality, the curves have flattened with our latest data from February 2017 to February 2018. So again, no one is declaring victory. Everybody has to redouble our efforts, but I want everyone to know when they go to bed at night that what we're doing really matters. There are people alive today. There are children who do not have neonatal abstinence syndrome. There are people who will not develop HCV or HIV because of your efforts. So let's keep it moving. Thank you so much. I wanted to end on that. Unfortunately, time has gotten away from us. I'm so, so sorry, but we, we need to have more days just like this. Can we extend this till tomorrow and the next day and make it a weekend event? The Office of Public Liaison folks are, no, it's a lot of work. Um, Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. And I think we're going heading to the breakouts in a little bit, right? DEA now. DEA now. Great. Thank you. They're telling me what's happening. DEA now and then breakouts in a little bit. Thank you so much to the panel. We really appreciate it. Thanks for ending on a high note.